So here's the hook. The hook is, comprom is composed of four steps. Every hook has four phases. It starts with a trigger to an action, then a reward, and finally an investment. So we're going to walk you through these four steps. Every hook starts with a trigger. A trigger is a call to action. It's a cue. It tells the user what to do next. And these triggers come in two types, two flavors, if you will. By the way, little side note, I see some of you taking pictures of the slides. That's totally fine. I will give you these slides, too, at the end. So don't feel like you have to write voraciously. So we have these two types of triggers, external triggers and internal triggers. External triggers are things in our environment that tell us what to do next, where the information for what to do is in the trigger itself. Okay? Click here, buy now, tweet this, play this. A friend telling you about this great new product that they bought that you should really check out for yourself. All examples of external triggers. The information is in the trigger itself. We all know these. We see these every day as consumers. We design these for our businesses. We know about external triggers. However, what I find business people don't think about enough, and what turns out to be absolutely critical when it comes to forming these long-term habits, is creating an association with an internal trigger. An internal trigger is a cue that tells the user what to do next, but the information for what to do is not in the trigger itself, as is the case with the external trigger, but instead what to do next, the information is contained as a memory in the user's mind. So what we do in response to being in a certain place, a certain situation, around certain people, partaking in a particular routine, and most frequently when we experience a certain emotion, dictates the behaviors that we do with little or no conscious thought. Right? This prompts our habits, these internal triggers. So the ultimate goal of these habit-forming businesses is to not need those external triggers over time. So eventually, the customer doesn't need to be externally triggered. We don't have to send them messaging. We don't have to trigger them externally. They use these products and services on their own because they're triggered internally. Now, the most frequent internal triggers are these emotions, but not just any emotions. Specifically, they are negative emotions. So what we do when we're feeling lonesome or bored or tense or indecisive or fearful or lost, what we do when we experience these negative emotions dictates where we look for relief. Remember I told you about this pattern matching device that's on our necks, right? So wh whatever provides relief from these pain points reliably, this is where we turn to with little or no conscious thought. Now some of the evidence that shows that this is the case comes to us from a study that found that people suffering from depression check email more. Now think about that for a minute. Why would people, no, it's not because email makes you depressed. That's not why. What this study found was that people suffering from clinical depression checked email more because they experienced what psychologists call negative valence states. They felt down more frequently than the rest of the population. And what were they doing to boost their mood, to get out of that negative valence state? They were checking email more frequently than the rest of the population. And of course, if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this to some degree, don't we? What website or app do we check when people are feeling lonely? Where do they go? Facebook, of course. What about when we're feeling unsure about something? Before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer, what do we do? We Google it, of course. And what about between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you're feeling bored, you have that big project you don't feel like working on right now, where do you go? You go, to, you go to YouTube, you go to Amazon to do some shopping, you check sports scores, you check stock prices, you check news websites. Why? To alleviate this internal trigger of boredom. We don't like this sensation of boredom. It's an itch that we seek to scratch. And the solution to that discomfort is found in the products we use with little or no conscious thought. Now, this is a bit of interesting pop psychology. Some of you are thinking, okay, that's kind of 
kind of interesting. I guess I kind of do use these products from time to time when I'm feeling these, uh, these negative emotions. But what do we do with this? How do we build better products and services knowing about the importance of these internal triggers? Well, it comes down to fundamentally understanding your user's itch. It's very hard to create a habit unless we know what that internal trigger actually is. It's amazing how many companies I meet with and they can tell me everything that the product needs to do from a functional standpoint, but when I ask them about the psychological functions of the product, they have no clue. They don't understand the psychological requirements or the itch that that product is addressing for their customer. So that's critical to figure out. Figure out what those internal triggers are throughout the user's day that prompt them to action on their own and attach your product or service to that internal trigger. Now, the question then becomes, how do we know our customers' internal triggers? How do we figure out what we could attach to to prompt them to action throughout their days? Well, there's a lot of different techniques we can use to figure out the customer's internal trigger. There's several details in the book. One that I, that I particularly am, am partial to is figuring out the customer narrative. Has anybody built a user narrative before? Oh, a couple people. So user narratives are very powerful. They're basically all about creating a, a timeline or a play, steps in the user's day when they would come to use your product or service. And this isn't a technique I invented. It's a, a technique that's been used uh, for quite a while in the design community. One person who's a big advocate of this technique is Jack Dorsey, the founder or the co-founder of Twitter and Square. And I'm going to let you see a quick video from Jack describing how they use user narratives at the companies that he's helped build. One of the biggest things um, that has helped me oh, is video. learning how to become a better storyteller and the power of a story. And by this I mean if you want to build a product and you want to build a product that is relevant to folks, you need to put yourself in their shoes and you need to write a story from their side. So we spend a lot of time writing what's called user narratives of this user or this person is in the middle of Chicago and they go to a coffee store in the middle of Chicago and this is the, the experience they're going to have. It reads like a play. It's really, it's really, really beautiful. And if you do that story well, then all of the prioritization, all of the product, all of the design, and all the coordination that you need to do uh, with these products just falls out naturally because you can edit the story and everyone, everyone can relate to the story from all levels of the organization, engineers to operations to support to designers to you know, the, business, the business side of the house. Um, so that story is very, very important for us. So Jack takes this stuff very seriously, right? He talks about how these narratives are like a play, how beautiful they are. And what's significant about how Jack uses these narratives in his organizations is that it's not just some marketing veneer, right? It's not something that we put on the product after the product is built. It defines the product. What we build, what features we do and don't build into our product are specified by the user narrative. And as Jack says, Everyone in the organization understands this user narrative. He talks about from design to the engineers to the business side of the house. Everybody understands this user narrative, this story of where our user would be in time and space and, and psychologically to use this product or service. 